Hello. <laughs> Sorry, we were getting a, a late start, but we are doing a session on extending the abstract class of privilege, outcomes, and lessons learned. I'm Farah Sabah. I am a Drupal developer with Booz Allen Hamilton. Do you want to do yours? <laughs> Hi, and I'm uh, Ashraf. I uh, run Debug Academy. Um, yeah, let's jump into it. So, oh, we're going to have to transition on two monitors separately. Um, all right, so we wanted to talk about what privilege is first. Um, there's some disagreement about the uh, definition um, amongst you know, five-year-olds and adults. We don't all agree. Um, but basically, you can see here, it's when some people can eat candy every day. They don't even have to ask. They just get it. And other people can ask nicely, and they don't. Um, they don't have access to it. The uh, less fun definition um, is unearned accesses to resource, resources. Um, feel free to read through that. Um, but that definition tends to make people feel uncomfortable. Um, I think it's the word unearned when you're talking to someone and telling them they have something that they didn't earn. Um, tends to strike a nerve. And if, you know, if that's how you feel, fair enough. Um, but I think we can define it from the other perspective. Um, and we'll find that more people tend to be um, in agreement over the existence of this problem. Um, you want to talk about that, or you want me to go? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what is being underprivileged? Um, you're lacking the access to the resources, expecting that much less people have a problem than they're trying to convey. Um, we're realizing that rectifying the above would be a future goal that is actually very attainable, um, but we are reducing the benefits that they have just by preconceived notions, which is something that we need to work on, which is the purpose of this. Um. So to illustrate, I'm going to tell you about something that happened to me in high school. Um, so when I was in high school, I got pulled over for speeding. Initially, the cop was pretty friendly, joking around with me like, oh, man, you know, what are you driving, an airplane? You know, that kind of stuff. Very friendly. I still expected to get a ticket. Um, but overall, you know, I wasn't very worried. I handed him my license, and that's when it changed. He read my name, basically felt, then, then he looked at me differently immediately after reading my name. Um, he got very hostile, basically switched from joking to mad. And he basically was accusing me of speeding in pursuit of terrorism. Um, he literally switched his line of questioning from, you know, were you driving an airplane to, do you have a bomb in your car? Do you have machine guns in your car? And he wasn't joking. My reaction was, surely you can't be serious. And he didn't take too kindly to that. So he arrested me. He towed my car, handcuffed me, took me to the police station. Um, when that, during that ride, I, I tend to not really get phased when people say insulting things because I'm just like, oh, it's unfortunate that you're that unintelligent. Um, but I don't take it really personally. So I was basically sitting in the cop car, hands handcuffed behind my back, and I started a conversation. So I said, do you pull people over often? And um, he, yeah, he engaged. You know, first he, would, he continued to be hostile, but um, eventually he basically was, you know, felt bad for arresting me. Um, and he apologized. He said, I shouldn't have done that, but I already called it in, so I can't call it in and say I changed my mind. So he took me in anyway. And they put me in a holding cell for about eight hours. Um, that was not his decision. So from that point forward, he pretty much became an ally. He was like defending me, saying, oh, we should let him go. You know, He didn't do anything too bad. But the person there, kind of had his same initial reaction, and she was like, no, we're keeping him locked up. Um, so she kept me locked up for 10 hours, even though I had the bail ready to pay, and I was ready to leave. 
Um, the, the talk isn't fully about this, but a lot of people have trouble accepting that you know, privilege is a real thing. But I think this example really illustrates it clearly because he was very nice, then very mean, then very nice. And um, this actually impacted my career because when I was, um, not in a big way, but when I was interviewing for a job that required a security clearance, they said, have you ever been arrested? I had to say yes. Um, and they didn't like that. Um, so we're talking about issues that stem, you know, you'd never think that sort of thing would happen. But a lot of people that take my class um, have faced all sorts of situations that you wouldn't expect them to have gone through beforehand. Um, let me see. Okay, so. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, we all have biases. You can see this uh, tweet basically. Yesterday, a professor asked a room full of medical students who had been, um, asked them who had been mistaken for the nurse in the clinical situations. And every female and one black male raised their hand. Um, not a single white male raised their hand. Um, basically, bias in professional fields is real. Um, we all have biases. Even people who are underprivileged have biases. Um, it's natural. But you have to be aware of them, and you can't blindly trust your instincts. When you meet someone and you have a reaction, um, before they speak especially, you can't assume that your reaction is right. You know, you have all this life experience, etc. Uh, you have to kind of stop before you talk and say, what kind of reaction did I have? Um, what part of it is based in fact about this person specifically? And if you had some reaction, and you were able to catch yourself, don't then proceed to say, oh, I originally thought this, and I realized this. You know, Keep it to yourself. It doesn't help anybody. Um, we don't want anyone to feel unwelcome, even in those comments in passing. If people are worried that you feel a certain way, you don't want to kind of confirm, I did have that thought, but I don't have that thought. You know, <laughs> um, Yeah, so you go with the next one. I actually requested to do this one since I've had my share of uh, gender bias. Um, there have been so many things since I've started web development as a new career, since that wasn't actually where I started. I dealt with having, after taking Debug Academy, I um, became a Drupal developer. And even when I was going to interviews or just talking in general, people would assume that I knew less than I did. And because of that, I assumed it too. And it actually hindered my ability to really believe in myself until, until later, until I had uh, changed to a different company, which I'll get into that in a second. Um, yeah, so women tend to be assigned tasks. I'm gonna just start with my story really quick. Yes, I'm short, thank you. <laughs> um, so my first tech job, I worked for a startup that was seven men and me. And since it was such a small office, it kind of had that family feel to it, which I didn't think it was, but anyway. Um, right when I had started, the president and vice president, they started giving me things like kitchen tasks or um, refilling paper, things like that, things that were administrative that they could probably do themselves. But because I was there and willing to help, which is how they so lovingly put it, um, they started doing it more and more until finally I just, I couldn't take it. And that's when I, I didn't lash out, but, <laughs> but they finally knew that they weren't supposed to be asking me that since I was hired as a web developer, uh, which brings me to a different story and I was hired as a junior dev, and the only other one, the only other developer was a senior one. So we were assigned to work closely together. And after a while, it was, it was pretty good. I was there a few, min, a few months, and he started to act weird, and I wasn't sure why. And it escalated to a point where I had to call him out and be like, 
Is there something going on that you're not telling me? Did I do something? Am I not doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And he proceeded to pull me in a, into a conference room and starts yelling at me, saying that he thought I had wanted to be a developer, that I was being too social with the other people in the office, which was confusing since we all kind of talked most of the day, since we were such a small team. And he then said that his feelings for me were affecting his objectivity, which again confused me. Since he was maybe 10 years older and I had given him no indication that that was something I wanted, um, even after he had asked if I wanted to get drinks and things like that. And yeah, I clearly wasn't interested, but <laughs> he, after he had finished yelling at me, he didn't apologize or anything. We just left and he pulled the PM into a meeting and he just explained everything that had happened. And an hour later, the PM came to me and apologized profusely. He's like, I have no idea where that came from. I'm so sorry. You're able to work from home if you want for a few days a week, but we can't force you to be here. And it was kind of strange to me since I was so new to the tech world and I didn't want to cause too many ripples. And I just said, it's fine, we'll work it out, it'll be all right. So um, that day, as luck would have it, I caught the flu of my life. And I was home for a little over a week. When I came back to the office, he was gone. And I had no idea what happened. They told me he had moved projects and it was fine. I just said, okay, whatever. That's, I kind of expected that. A few months go by and it turned out, they had finally told me that he had fallen apart that week and came into the office like unkempt. He was sobbing. I'm, I have no idea why, but, um, and he had told them that he had a gun, which was an extreme reaction. So they had asked him to leave, and if he had left right away, they wouldn't call anyone. He would just need to seek help. So I didn't know that. <laughs> it, months went by before they told me that, and the only indication I had was that the week after I came back, I needed to be walked to my car or actually the month I came back. So two people would alternate, walking me to my car every day. And I had no idea why. I just thought maybe he would profess his love to me in a different way. <laughs> but obviously, that's an extreme thing. Most stories like that don't involve firearms. Um, but the more I told that story, the more I realized that people, women, would come back to me with a similar story. And that's something that, I'm sorry, would not happen to most men <laughs> because you're in a professional setting and you work closely with people and you don't expect to be pulled into a conference room after having just joined the tech world and be yelled at for nothing, only to have him say that and then deal with the firearm issue, but <laughs> he still haunts my dreams, if that. <laughs> but because of that, I was nervous, way more nervous than I needed to be, because I wasn't sure of my ability anymore. I thought maybe I was hired because he had liked me, because he was the one who interviewed me. So when I was dealing with that, I was like, oh no, maybe I'm not as good to even work anywhere, and I stayed there until um, our contract ended. And I wish I hadn't because I joined Booz Allen Hamilton and uh, joined an incredible team that I have never seen, I feel like this should be at the end, but I've never seen so many women in tech and just able to support and improve my skills. Okay, let's... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, we open up with you know the personal stories, but it gets a little lighter. Um, <laughs> let's see. So uh, you might have read the the slide, but um, 
there are a couple of things that you might be doing in your office or might be happening in your office uh, that you don't notice. Um, there have been studies on this. It's the, uh, most of the things, you know, it's not cited because it's a PowerPoint, but uh, most of the things are based on research um, and there, as well as personal experiences, of course. Um, but there is a tendency to assign women uh, tasks that are less impressive. And what I mean by that is tasks where, um, you know, maybe it's like, okay, you go fix up the styling and, you know, we have something more complicated, like a, maybe a migration, and we'll give that to the guy. Um, there's a tendency to do that and think nothing of it. Uh, but that kind of accumulates and um, impacts promotions, impacts uh, future job interviews. Like, what did you work on? Well, I mostly did, you know, styling. It's, it's different than saying you did a migration. Um, and, in, you know, in programming, even if you feel like the woman hasn't done it before, um, I think I've seen more tendency to give a guy who hasn't done something before um, something he hasn't done before. Uh, whereas with women, you might just think, well, she does front end um, and not really test the waters and find out if she likes to do back end development. Um, was there something you wanted to? All right. Um, yeah, and we, you know, we just had other examples. Uh, my. My, my mom, actually, she majored in um, electrical engineering, and when she was interviewing, uh, one of the things she saw from a few people was basically, oh God, you're gonna leave and have kids. So that was something that, you know, when she was interviewing was something people could say out loud. Um, but basically, you know, there's all sorts of uh, barriers that, um, you know, people of various genders uh, face that maybe, you know, men don't experience. Uh, so, you know, I teach the Debug Academy classes, and um, I worked at Acquia for a while. I was doing it part-time, but I found that there was a lot, I know I haven't pulled up the bullets yet, but I, I, uh, I found there's a lot of opportunity to kind of help people who wouldn't get into tech otherwise if only I had more time. Um, but some things I've learned from running the classes are women are just as interested in tech as men. It's it's not even a question of um, what they were doing before. If you talk to them and you pick your words carefully, you don't say, do you do tech? You might say, is that something you're curious about? It, you know, Or you, you present it as, well, I think you can do it. Would you want to do it? You know, the, the wording can, um, can really influence it. But basically, um, you know, just as many women are interested as uh, men that I speak to. And um, female students tend to be the top performers in the class. Um, you'll often have, sometimes you'll have a guy come in with more tech experience and just kind of um, think that they get it all and you'll have women come in and think, you know, maybe this field isn't for me, but they tend to work harder. Um, and I've found that, you know, we do an assessment and exam at the end of the semester um, and the female students tend to do better than the male students in general. Um, so how have we actually helped or extended privilege for them? The first one is, you know, they get message, you know, people get messages um, basically that make them feel like they're not welcome into tech. So you have to counter that. Um, it's not just about being neutral. Um, you kind of have to let them know, um, you know, this is something you can do. Um, it's not as complicated as people like to make it sound. Um, let's give you the information, take a stab at it. If you don't like it, you know, it's not the end of the world. Uh, one of the things that I've done in the class is typically when you sign up for a class, let's say you attend the first week and you drop out, there's typically a big penalty. Uh, we just, we give work before the semester starts for the, sem for the month before the semester starts, just HTML, CSS, that sort of thing. Um, if you really don't like that, then maybe you shouldn't take the class. You know, it's a chance to find that out. But also, during the semester, um, if you're two or three weeks in, I've had a couple of people basically approach me and just say, okay, this isn't for me. You know, I don't like it. Um, and, you know, depending on the semester, honestly, because it is a business, we will have some where we'll just refund them the whole payment if we can. Um, but otherwise, we don't give a penalty for having joined the course. We essentially prorate it. You pay for the classes you took, you get all the money back for the ones you haven't taken. Um, 
And that's been helpful for people to also make the decision because they think if I take one class, it's not the end of the world if I drop out. Also, we strongly endorse them, and this is something everyone can do. Um, if you know a woman looking to get into tech and you're already in tech, you can speak up for them, um, you know, refer them, that sort of thing. Um, but basically, unfortunately, sometimes when women go to interviews, they're not taken as seriously for whatever reason. And someone who is, you know, a little more well known in tech um, can put in a good word for them and it can make a difference. Um, and I say strongly, intentionally, you can, don't just say like, I referred her, you know, um, speak to her level because unfortunately people tend to, some, you know, certain people uh, will take what you say as truth and won't take it as truth when they say it. So you kind of just help them on the way in and then they've got it from there. Um, there's a big, you know, grow Drupal movement. Uh, basically, um, when we p submit a patch to Drupal.org, we're really careful because we know, uh, you know, it'll go through a, a tight, you know, a strong review process. Um, put that much effort into helping other people get into tech. Put that much effort into the referral email that you send. Um, this is a email that I sent, I guess the date's on it, February 21st. Um, I don't have a template for my emails when I'm referring people in the class. I get to know the people and I write, you know, something that accurately reflects their knowledge. Um, I find when I'm referring a guy, I maybe have to say a little bit about his personality, like, oh, he's introvert, extrovert, you know, um, he knows PHP. When I'm referring to a uh, woman, I tend to have to really explicitly lay it out to kind of cancel out the assumptions that the employer often has. Um, so like with this one, basically my emails for the guys who take the class tend to be much shorter. Um, but for this one, I'm referring someone named Lisa, you know, I, it feels like overkill. Um, when I read it, it feels like overkill. Um, but it just kind of tends to be necessary. Lisa, um, she does have a degree. Oh, she actually just walked in. Hey, Lisa. Um, <laughs> yeah, she has a degree in engineering, but she took some time off of work and, um, you know, it, tend, it can be hard for people to get back into tech. Um, so, you know, with the uh, email I sent to, um, to an employer, uh, I basically had to make sure to lay out what experience she had before that and what level I felt like she was at uh, because employers tend to um, kind of make assumptions in the wrong direction uh, for female applicants. And Lisa recently accepted a job offer. Congratulations, Lisa. <laughs> Um, so I feel like older people also have this bias. Just to use a quick example, um, my, my dad works as an accountant with the federal government. Um, they're implementing a new system and it was assumed that he would need a few months extra to learn. And even though he had gotten it and it wasn't as difficult as he had thought, he was working at the standard level they were still trying to not get him out, but wanting him to retire a little sooner so that they can bring in some young blood, which is how they exactly put it, and um, do it, crank it out a little bit faster. So um, assuming that they can't learn the tech, that they would need extra time for it, or that they don't even want to learn it, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, things like that are things that just are dangerous assumptions because they not only have um, the incredible experience that can only help, but um, most problems that they've dealt with before have been solved. So using that knowledge to pass it along is only going to further every young developer, every mid-developer, even older people who don't have the resources to learn as quickly. Then Luann. Oh. All right. Uh, yeah, we actually had a, a student um, <laughs> take the class um, the semester before last. Um, her name is Luann. Hi, Luann, if you're watching this. Um, she 
was near retirement, and she's not the only person who takes the class when they're about to retire. Actually, I've had a, um, a handful. Um, and basically, she's never programmed before. She's, she's had some, some experience, um, some technical experience, but she hasn't used Drupal before. And um, she took the class. She was one of the top performers. And now that she graduated and she retired, um, she is actually going to be working uh, with a cool nonprofit. She's basically volunteering um, on nonpro nonprofit Drupal sites. Um, there's one in particular, I'm going to give it a shout out because I forgot to put it in the presentation. <laughs> uh, Hope One Source, it's a, a Drupal based nonprofit in the DC area where they um, basically make uh, resources easier to locate for homeless people. Um, so she's, you know, she's a. Uh, Joining the, joining the class, joining the Drupal community um, after retiring, and she's going to be doing some good with it. Um, if you'd like to do so. So, okay. <laughs> um, so, racial bias. That is something that I've heard and I've seen, and it is incredibly inaccurate. But um, a, a black person early in their career usually has to prove that their personality isn't the preconceived personality that would be of any black person. And that is such a shame because people of any kind of ethnicity, of any kind of level, can provide valuable information and experience and knowledge um, to to be what corporate wants you to be would be someone well-spoken and charming all the time, which is fine. I mean, if you're going to be um, like the face of a company, it would make sense. But to have someone in the tech world or any field want to be able to extend their knowledge and learn new things and teach new things, that is obviously inaccurate. And. Um I've seen this a lot, again, in the classes um, with some of the black students who take the class. I sometimes will go with them to the interview and do an in-person introduction um, because I've seen uh, on occasion, uh, basically some of them will have, you know, solid technical knowledge and, um, you know, bias creeps in from the interviewer and they just don't give them uh, a fair chance. Um, basically, I've seen people who, you know, piece of, people of every ethnicity and programming who are introverted, just quiet, etc. Um, but I've seen that be taken um, in a negative light for black students. Basically, they'll they'll go in and be quiet, you know, not speak up, you know, not sell themselves that well, and it's almost like the interviewer assumes like something's up, you know. Whereas if you have you know, someone else who is quiet, the interviewer tends to assume, well, they're just a nerd. You know, they, they, they just like, they have that nerdy personality where they're quiet and, you know, not great socially. Um, but I, I, it's not taken the same way. Um, so yeah, I, I, I again, um, try to extend the privilege sort of thing by uh, trying to, you know, let them, you, you kind of try to paint a picture and it really sucks that, you know, that's necessary at all. Like I shouldn't, have to, and you know, it feels, it feels wrong to say it because it's like that's not something I should have to do. But um, nonetheless, until we get uh, you know more diverse people in higher positions, um, it's kind of necessary to you know ex to speak up for them. Um, and I hear this a lot. Um, I hear I've heard this from CEOs. This doesn't apply to me. I don't see color. <laughs> Yeah, um, great. I'm glad you don't see color. That's a, that's a start. Uh, but the thing is, object, objectivity has sailed at this point. There are people who genuinely will just, you know, see people of different races and be like, "Well, I'm judging you all exactly the same." You know, um, it's a technical test. There's there's no bias into it. Um, but I've but basically, if you're the only person who doesn't see color, it's still not totally a fair situation for the person coming to the interview. You know, they're dealing with a bunch of other people who do have 
biases. You know, I'm, I'm giving the benefit of the doubt to the people who say I don't see color. I'm not saying you, um, you have biases that um, affect this. But um, yeah, if you want to play that game, other people do have biases that affect that. Um, so in some cases, um, it's you know neutral isn't equal. Um, so you'll have to to have a to really find out does this person have the aptitude to be a programmer? Like could they make it in this field? Rather than just giving them a PHP test, um, and I'm not saying this is easier to do. For it to be fair, it's more like you know you find out how much exposure have they had to it. Maybe you put them on a trial where you give them you know, education, training, something like that. Um, basically, and, th and then you kind of test them after that, after they've had a chance to sit with the material, um, soak it in, be in an environment that they may have not had the opportunity to be in before. Um, because I have had people, it's something I've really been torn about in my class, like do I accept everybody or do I only accept people who pass some sort of minimum knowledge test? And um, I've gone with accept everybody because there are always situations where, where someone will not know anything related to programming at the beginning of the class and that person shines at the end and joins the career. You know. The downside to that um, is you know, sometimes you'll have people take the class and they really aren't cut out for programming. Um, and that's kind of where we have the, what I talked about earlier, if you drop out, it's prorated, there's no penalty. Um, that's kind of the balance we strike. And like I said, you know, depending on how things are going with the business, we, we have refunded the full tuition on multiple occasions where, you know, we're three weeks into class and someone's like, I just don't get it, you know, it's, you know I'm not picking it up. Um, This, um, I'd like to do this slide. <laughs> uh, so this is a picture of our alumni at Drupal GovCon uh, 2017. You know, not a planned picture, they all just happened to be there. Um, I was posting an ad on Facebook for our class and I used that picture. And um, you know, like I said, everybody has biases. You can be aware of other people's biases as well, but you have to stop and think, is this based in logic or is it just, you know, some bias that I need to overcome? So, you know, the truth is when I was posting this picture, I was like, you know, there might be people who basically are racist who see this picture and might think, I don't want to take that class. Um, and I was like, that's more reason I should use this picture. <laughs> um, so. Because you know, on the one hand, that's thinking about the people who may be racist and look at it badly. But what about the other people? You know, what about the you know, diverse people in the picture? That just means other companies are thinking this too and those people are not seeing themselves in these ads. Um, so I posted it, I figured you know, I'm being silly. Um, so I just posted it. And I got a bunch of racist comments. <laughs> I got a bunch of comments that were like, looks like it's all black, these are quotes, you know, looks like it's all blacks and Muslims, I wouldn't go there, be careful who you give your money to, it's a Islamist organization, all this crazy stuff. Um, I don't even know if Islamist is really a word, but that's what it said. Um, so my concerns were real, you know, realized. Um, I first deleted comments, but they kept coming, uh, so I basically replied and that actually ended up stopping them. Um, looks like it's all blacks and Muslims, I wouldn't go there. And I replied, well, you're not welcome. <laughs> um, so, you know, he just stopped talking. Um, but, you know, just by posting that ad, you know, if, if you don't see color, people who do see color create a really crappy environment <laughs> and others have to deal with it before they get to you. So um, that's why we have to put effort into reaching out and making it more welcoming because it's not neutral. Like neutral is not equal. Uh, so a few more um, examples of bias would be family life. Assuming that anyone with a family, with children, um, even just close friends that need your help, <laughs> they 
would want to work from home more even though it wasn't needed or um, leave early and they push their tasks to someone else, delegating like everything that was complicated, which I've seen a few times in uh, previous jobs. And having, having that kind of situation at home and working full time is very, it's hard to find that right balance. So realizing that it's not just an excuse and to find, um, to help people find that balance or to work around with them would be ideal. Um, another one, disabilities, someone with having a uh, visible, physical, any kind of disability in this field or any field um, is also something that would need, um, need to be overlooked since when I first, I'm just gonna tell this really quick. When I first started um, a tech position, there was someone in our office that was completely confined to a wheelchair and couldn't move, um, couldn't move anything below, I guess his hands, and he was still able to, to type. And he, people looked at him weird, and I felt really bad, and I would try to, to connect with him. And he was a full stack developer. He knew so much, and I learned so much from him just by being there and just by interacting with him more than everyone else did. So I was really grateful for that. Um, single employees. I, I dealt with this also. I'm hitting all of these points just by that one job. But um, assuming that people who are available to work, who don't have families, don't have um, something going on at home, are able to be online at all hours of the day and night, um, I've had employers tell me that because I don't have a family, because I didn't have kids at home or anything like that, um, I could attend every event that week and show myself off because I was a pretty girl who would only benefit from having them see me. That was, yeah. <laughs> Somebody. I thought I was going to say more about that, but yeah. no, I'll leave it. <laughs> yeah. Somebody needs to punch that. <laughs> um, so, whose job is it to fix this? If you can see the quote, I'm starting with the man in the mirror. Love that song. <laughs> I also love that movie. Um, <laughs> all right. So, the thing is, nothing is too small. Um, Actually, do you want to do the slide? Because some of it is from you. Oh. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, so small things can make an impact. Um, I actually just learned this uh, yesterday that when, after I had taken the Debug Academy class, I went back to assist in a Git training that was open to the public. And during that time, I mentioned how, how it had changed my life, how I became a Drupal developer, and the class worked. Because of that, a student that had attended just the Git training decided to take the class and was recently hired as a Drupal developer. I didn't know at that time, and I wish I did actually because I would have pushed him more, but it was, it made me feel really good because just by raising awareness, he was able to join an amazing community and have a bomb job. <laughs> um, so nothing's too small. Uh, reaching, that was also reaching beyond my circle since I hadn't planned on helping with that. I just kind of came last minute and wanted to uh, meet other developers, meet someone who just needed my help. And um, because of that, I've continued to do it. And I've um, volunteered, I've gone to events, Booz Allen Hamilton especially, I've gone to a few events there and just extending my circle and making sure that anyone who feels underrepresented or um, needs any kind of support is something that I can help with. 
oh, which goes into the next one, participating in the free training events. Um, I had actually tried to get that first company to uh, get involved with the Hour of Code that teaches um, kids how to code um, during a week in December, I think, and they refused. So that kind of tells you what kind of company they were. <laughs> okay, you want to finish that? speed up a little. So, all right, uh, let's see. Sorry about that. Yeah, and uh, one of the bullets, basically, like she was saying, uh, she encouraged her employers to participate in a free training. Um, that one didn't pan out, but um, it's, you know, that's what we need to do. Just like uh, make others who aren't thinking about it aware. Some of them will say yes, and that might, you know, impact one or two people at the end of the day. Um, you might get a new core contributor, you know, uh, they, they can go um, go through the whole process and eventually um, there's a lot of talent out there basically that doesn't know they're talented. <laughs> um, let's see. So speaking about uh, reaching out beyond our circle, um, let me try to get the text out of here. Okay. So I, you know, I I uh, follow a lot of people outside of my circle on Twitter. I really just like I'm like this isn't someone I would talk to. Follow, you know, um, because I I want to um, bring more people in. And um, so this is someone I had never met before. Um, she tweeted basically that she was going to become a great developer and that she was going to be an inspiration for Black girls. Um, I thought that was really cool. Um, so, you know, I followed her and she she tweeted on other occasions things that basically um, gave away that um, she wasn't, you know, that well off financially. Um, but she still had an awesome attitude and I uh, reached out to her. We had the DrupalCon, the React.js class here on Monday. It was sold out for $450 a person. Um, when I tell that to like employers here, they're like, oh, okay, that's reasonable. But if you talk to people who, you know, I don't know, you know, are not developers or are not at this type of company, that's a lot of money. Um, but I invited her to it and she enthusiastically accepted. Um, but she didn't show up. <laughs> so we had that training, she didn't show up. Um, you know, I was like, all right, whatever. You know, I tried, I invited her. Uh, four days later or so, I was like, you know, I'm giving a talk on privilege and on, you know, not being lazy about it. Uh, let me message her and see why she didn't show up. Or, you know, truthfully, I didn't ask why she didn't show up because it's not my business. But see if she had a reason. You know, I don't need to know what the reason is. Um, so I, I reached out to her. You know, I said, oh, you know, it's cool that you didn't show up. Did you not want to? You know, did something come up? Um, and she was really surprised I reached out, but she basically said, you know, something came up, she couldn't make it, and she was really embarrassed. Um, so she didn't reach out because of that. Uh, so I told her, you know what, come to the next one. So she came to the next one, and, you know, I met her, she met Drupal. After the class, she, you know, put out this tweet. Um, it was a class on React.js. She hadn't heard of Drupal, so I just told her to come to the React class. Um, but the last sentence of that, she was excited about Drupal. Um, and, you know, feel free to follow her. But basically, she's in a community that, you know, I'm not going to run, out, run into in, in my circle of friends. Um, she's on a Slack channel that um, is basically a... a channel for black people interested in tech in DC. Um, you know, so she has now heard of Drupal and she goes back there, she's telling them all about Drupal. Um, if she ends up getting into Drupal, I think she would be awesome to have because every day she's tweeting about something new she's building um, and it's all in her spare time, et cetera. Um, you know, so it's it's very possible that eventually she'll be a core contributor. She seems like that personality type. Um, but just by reaching out a little, it didn't cost me anything to have another person in the room. You know, so just by reaching out a little, um, it could potentially have a big impact on Drupal and more importantly on her.
We're going to need to speed this up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what does better look like? As far as Drupal goes, having been a beginner um, pretty recently in the past three years or so, the documentation for that was a little hard to follow for me. And thankfully, the initiative seems to be happening soon and things are getting clear, um, getting explained. They're becoming easier for people to actually use it and not have to go through a long list of 650 comments trying to go through that issue queue. Yeah. Um, okay. Package uh, contrib composer dependencies and is a file like core does. Um, yeah. yeah, so I'll just mention this one because it's an, an idea I had. Uh, but basically, Composer really is a, a barrier to entry for, um, for many. It's mentioned on the next slide as well, but I'll just speak to that now. Um, basically, a lot of my students used to um, you know, work a lot of hours, and they would work on the classwork on Metro. Um, a lot of them wouldn't have internet access. Um, on, on Metro and they would have weak internet access at home or especially with Metro, you know, literally you, you pop out of a tunnel, you, you know, you have internet for a few minutes and then you pop back in. Um, Composer being, requ I don't want to say required because they say it's not required, but um, using Composer uh, pretty much kills working in Metro and that has been, you know, that has had a real impact on people. Um, also with weak internet connections and that sort of thing. Uh, so one thing I was considering is core, you know, when you download core in a certain way, it comes without the vendor directory, without all the files. You run Composer install, you get them. But if you download core from the zip file, it comes packaged with the vendor directory. And that's how, that's why they say you don't need Composer. I think they should do that for contrib modules too. Package the contrib modules vendor directory. Um, so that people who download the zip file don't need to then use Composer at all. Uh, maybe you would throw in another set of instructions, you know, drag the vendor directory to this folder or something like that. Um, and, you know, if a rebuttal were on the technical side, um, those technical, the technical issues that uh, apply to the suggestion I just made also applied to downloading modules using Drush in Drupal 7, but that was good enough for a lot of people. Um, so I recommend throwing, you know, at least another link that says, can't use Composer, here's a full download link for the module. Um, and auto-populating uh, documentation, uh, we, we actually ran something called a barrier-free sprint. I'm gonna try to not talk too long about this, but um, did I bring it over? I don't know, I have it on this monitor. Okay, so what we do for our classes is we write documentation for our projects, um, and then this is a task on, a actual web, on an actual project on Drupal.org. Um, we ran what's called a barrier-free sprint, um, and basically it's a sprint where you can come in, maybe you haven't used Drupal before, uh, but you can actually set up a Drupal site and contribute something back um, without any training on it. So we do that using this website we made. Um, the issue's up here, but scroll down, how to install a Drupal site. Um, one time setup, it has composer instructions. If those don't work, it has git instructions. Um, alternative, if you're advanced, you can do it that way. How to start a new task. You know, you do more than one task, you only go to these instructions. And how to submit a completed task. Um, we are not writing these instructions on every issue. We're writing them on the project, and they're auto-populating at the bottom of every issue. I think Drupal.org should have that. I think it should have issues, and then at a bare minimum, auto-populated quick links for, this is how you install Drupal core, this is how you install the module. Um, using a module like the token where you can swap out text automatically, you can write instructions for installing a module once, put a token for the module name, and have it auto-populate throughout the site. Um, so basically, we don't need to write the documentation for every module, uh, but we could populate it. Um, so put in a little technical work, and we can really make this much easier, uh, make contributing and using Drupal much easier. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, we'll just go straight to 
that and um, looks like it stopped presenting when I left. View present. Um, so this is one of our students. Hopefully the audio works in this room. Basically, you could just talk a little bit about, you know, why you made the changes, the type of changes you made, um, what your experience was like, that sort of thing. <laughs> There's nothing out there identified to help, you know, identified to the community in regards to how you could use the path auto function in your URL. Mm -hmm. So with the documentation that I created with me having a little background and um, test writing, I actually created this document where I went step by step and added screenshots to the actual documentation I like to submit, laying out the path from start to finish in regards to how to use the path auto function. It actually has um, different ways where if you've already have content created, there's a path in there that identifies what you would need to do if you already have content identified that you want to go back after the fact and identify um, the correct path on there using the path auto function that's available for you now. All right, yeah, we love it. We just wanted you to be able to share it with everyone at DrupalCon. Um, okay. Thank you for Thank you much. I'm looking forward to it being posted. <laughs> All right, so that was Kevin, he's awesome. Uh, he also just accepted a job recently. Um, he, um, he's still a current student, and he wrote much better documentation for the Path Auto module than what we have out there. Um, so instead of, I feel like instead of devoting, devoting so many resources to maybe rewriting documentation, you could devote resources to um, getting people trained and maybe have them write documentation on their way in. Um, to go a little quicker. Um, I'm going to go through these really quickly so that we can get to the end. That is Kevin. Um, sorry. All right, sorry about that. We're just about out of time, so I want to um, get through those last ones pretty quickly. All right, so let's see where we're at. Okay, yeah, so this is Kevin, um, very nice guy. Um, yeah, he hadn't really used Drupal before, attended a free Git training, and now he's a Drupal developer. That's who had learned that I had become one and went to become one himself. Yeah. And this DrupalCon, three sessions are presented by people who took our classes. Um, I didn't even know two of them were applying. <laughs> um, but basically, um, they're all female. Um, you know, so this is all from one small program. And it's three speakers at DrupalCon. You know, so it's, it doesn't take some insurmountable budget to you know, increase the diversity in the community. You just have to do it. So the next three are the three speakers. Um, you can um, so if you hit right on the arrow, it'll go to the next slide. So the first ah, one is Kirsten. Okay, Kirsten, you probably know her because she's amazing. Um, she had actually already had um, development experience. I can't see this. Yeah. Okay. I'll do the next. Yeah. Yep. Oh, we're going that fast. <laughs> oh, no, I'm just no, no, it's fine. Okay. Um, Amani, she had um, become a, she majored in conflict analysis and resolution and became a Drupal developer with Beacon Fire Red. She's also a speaker. And the last one's on stage. That's me. <laughs> that was this morning. So. <laughs> I had never written a line of code and um, took the class. I became a Drupal developer and now work with Booz Allen Hamilton. Um, just going to. We've got just two more that we're showing. Um, you know, this is what a Drupal developer looks like. He's like one of the nicest people I know. Uh, very smart, and um, I think it's Pioneering Evolution that hired him. Shout out to them. Uh, great company um, who's you know willing to give people without development and uh, experience a chance. Um, 
but he's going to um, do very well in his career. Um, we've got Ali. He's you. <laughs> Ali, um, we had taken the debug class together, and he actually um, works on my team now. He had been an engineering major, I think. Uh, environmental science. Yeah, environmental. Yeah. And uh, now works in on my team in my office every single day. <laughs> I don't know about the tone there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's about it. Um, yeah, so we hope you enjoyed the session. Um, there's my Twitter, there's Farah's Twitter, um, and our emails. Uh, if you want to follow Debug Academy, um, you know, spread the word. Uh, we work really hard to um, increase the diversity in uh, the Drupal community. Um, I've been told it's a great community within the community. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're really, you know, proud of the three new speakers. I think they're, two of them are first time attendees at DrupalCon. Um, but yeah, that's all. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> if there are, let us know. I didn't expect questions in this one. We didn't want to answer them anyway. Yeah. <laughs> all right, thank you all for coming. Thank you. <laughs> like, how long do I have to smile? Wait, what? Thanks. Oh, okay. Well, I have to unplug. <laughs>